Introducing Thomas Hicks, our Master of Ceremonies for the evening and Hall of Fame legend, Richard Fisher. Well, you guys caught me. I was having a little pick-me-up with a can of Dr. Pepper. What a coincidence, huh? Tom Hicks and I have been friends for some 40 years. And today we either talk or text each other three or so times a day. And oddly, just like a can of Dr. Pepper says, most often at 10, 2, and 4. Although I confess, the 4 o'clock Dr. Pepper has been replaced by martinis. <laughs> Tom is a true friend. And the great business legends that we honor at the Text Hall of Fame all have many acquaintances, but few have true, true friends. A true friend knows your weaknesses, but shows you your strengths. A true friend feels your fears and fortifies your faith in yourself, sees your anxieties, but frees your spirit, recognizes your drawbacks, but emphasizes your possibilities. Tom has done that for me for 40 years, and I've endeavored to do it for him. Now, I was a midshipman at the U.S. Naval Academy, and in Annapolis, I was taught that anyone can hold a helm when the sea is calm, but it takes a very strong helmsman to navigate heavy seas. I have watched Tom sail the calmest seas with bravado, and I have watched him navigate the fiercest of storms. He has always held the helm. He has always kept going. And this is why I admire my neighbor, my friend, so much. Tom, it took a long time for the Texas Business Hall of Fame to honor you, but now is your moment. So congratulations, my friend, my true friend. Come up here and be honored. Tom. Richard Fisher, what a guy. He's the last Democrat I supported. <laughs> I was actually his state finance chairman when he ran against K. Bailey Hutchison. <clears throat> and uh, he would have made a great senator. His, his, his story was, I'll be a conservative Democrat. And uh, there weren't many. So, <laughs> uh, but Richard is, is one of the smartest guys I know. He is intellectually smart. He's uh, brilliant on his feet. He's great on TV with C <clears throat> on, uh, CNBC. He was, I asked him to be one of the founding outside directors on Utemco, which he did. He did a great job before he left to be an ambassador uh, <clears throat> in Washington. But anyway, at my age and everything I've done, that's a long story. And they've, get, they've allocated five minutes to each of us to, to make remarks. So I can't do that. So I'm gonna to touch on two small things. One is to talk about kind of how I got into this whole uh, really unknown business called private equity, or back then it was called venture capital, and how either the fates of life or divine intervention, but I got this opportunity and I jumped all over it. And the rest was history. And I'm gonna to touch briefly on <clears throat> when the governor of Texas asked me to come help her fix the uh, UT uh, endowment returns, which were among the worst in the country, and that led to the creation of UTEMCO. So I'll talk about those two briefly. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, venture capital, now it has a connotation of high tech. 
It didn't back then. It was just doing private investments. There was no such word as private equity. It was, it was called venture capital. Uh, and I didn't know what it was, but I was a marketing major at the University of Texas. But I had a chance to interview with, in, 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 with Continental Bank in Chicago, the biggest bank in, in Chicago and really in the, in the whole Midwest. And it was when I'd come out of the Army with, as I mentioned in the film, I was feeling very independent. So I wanted to send myself to graduate school at night at Northwestern, and the bank had that program. So I went to work for this bank. And by the way, Chicago in 1969 was not a bad place to be a young bachelor. Uh, so I had a lot of fun. Uh, there were 13 United Airlines stewardesses that lived on my floor. <laughs> and back then, if you were a stewardess and you got married, they, they fired you. Okay. But life changes. <laughs> anyway, I was, a, I was a young grunt in the credit department. I was doing analytical work and writing letters, replies to inquiries, and <clears throat> all the crap you do in the credit department as a, as a rookie. And somebody in the bank had the idea that, well, let's, they're talking about all this new stuff in Washington that banks are going to be allowed to do. And that was really the, uh, the lead up to what became the, one by, the Bank Holding Company Act of 1970. So they were looking at different businesses that a bank holding company could own. They were looking at travel agencies, they were looking at REITs. Uh, mortgage banking uh, operations, and venture capital, which banks did through a thing called a small business investment company, an SBIC. So they used us grunts in the credit department to go in the library and write the first draft of a report on what that business was all about. So I spent about two months researching this, this new word called venture capital. And I was fascinated with it. I mean, it was, it was really a cottage industry done primarily by uh, some wealthy guys. My wife Cinda's uncle was one of the pioneers uh, back in the 60s. And he, you know, they'd make a $50,000 investment in a startup. And if it was su successful, they'd make, you know, whatever, but a lot. And, <laughs> and, uh, There were the only institutional capital were, were the banks who was do, during, were doing it through their SBICs. So I ended up leaving the bank, went back to business school full time in Lo Los Angeles at USC, and I spent all my time focusing on venture capital. You know, all my friends were either real estate guys or bankers. Uh, nobody knew what I was interested in. And I mean, Dick Vermillion's here tonight. He, he, he had no idea what venture capital was. Uh, but in, in, at age 27, I was able to talk myself into get talk talk the bank into hiring me to, to come run the biggest venture capital subsidiary in the South, which was the First National Bank in Dallas. And so I came at age 27. I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I got the job, and uh, uh, after about th three years, I figured I was on the wrong side of the table. I wanted to be the guy on the other side of the table getting the money instead of being the guy dishing it out. <clears throat> so I had the opportunity to do my first leverage buyout, which I did at age 31. Uh, a company in Dallas called Atlas Architectural Metals. <clears throat> and I met a wonderful man in New York named Lewis Marks, who was a lifelong, became a lifelong friend, and he put up the money. And that kind of got me going. I, I started doing deals, and uh, I formed Hicks and Haas in 1984, 85. <clears throat> and at that time, Forceman Little had taken Dr. Pepper private, and then they sold off all the pieces, and we end up buying the biggest piece at the end, which was the bottling operation in uh, North Texas. 
And it was a 90, $95 million deal, which for guys that were playing penny ante, that was a lot, that was a big deal. <clears throat> and we raised the money through GE Capital. And step back and look at it. Today, private equity is now part of what they call alternative assets, is a $10 trillion industry. $10 trillion industry. Back then, I bet it was under a billion, for sure. Uh, it was such a small, highly inefficient market. We didn't have a fund, but we were able to buy Dr. Pepper because we were able to, to go convince people to invest in us. Uh, and we had the management team locked up, which was the key. But uh, it was truly a remarkable time, and I, I, I thank God for it because I think it was divine. But I was at the right place at the right time in the right business with the right people, and we had <clears throat> we had the success that we did. Bobby and I were great partners. We ended up disliking each other greatly because uh, we were just too, we were so different. It's like a marriage. They say if you're you know your opposites attract. Well, in business partners that can work for a while, but it you know it, it got old fast. But uh, Bobby passed away two years ago. We 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 reconciled. We lived in the same high rise, and uh, he. Uh, I forgave him for everything I was mad about, <laughs> but uh, we were a great team because I had the personality and the relationships to be able to bring unusual deal flow in. And Bobby, because we didn't have a fund, Bobby. We, was such a good negotiator, we ended up having much bigger pieces of deals at the end of the day than uh, otherwise we would have had. So I give him a lot of credit for that. Um, anyway, I formed Hicks Muse Tate and First. Charles Tate was my longtime partner there. He's here tonight. I saw he came by and said hi. Uh, we did 12 funds. Uh, and uh, along the way, as, as the film said, I, I, I bought this little hockey team because it was cheap. <clears throat> and then I fell in love with hockey, and then I won the damn Stanley Cup. And uh, because I was attuned to the buy and build aspect of, I, I saw that sports were, was all about regional t television. And if you're going to do that, you need to have a baseball team. So, uh, by the way, what's the score now? <laughs> my new son-in-law, as of the May, my, May, my number six son, Rick Cosgrove, is a lifelong Phillies fan. So he's he's <laughs> okay. Enough of that. So uh, let me talk about you, Timco, because. I'm a lifelong Republican, conservative. Uh, other than Richard, I never backed a, a Democrat. Uh, I had a lot of friends that were Democrats. Uh, Tom Dunning's one of my best friends. He's a Democrat. He's here tonight with, sitting at my table. But, uh, <clears throat> we may not be friends next Wednesday when the results come in. <laughs> I've got inside information. It's going to be a good day for like-minded people. <laughs> uh, anyway, a guy named Bob Utley, who is a great fan of UT, he didn't go there, but he's just a big fan of UT, was one of our investors, and uh, he asked me to go, go with him to come go meet with the governor. He said, I think, I think she, she would like to talk to you. <clears throat> she had appointed Pete Conway, who many of you here would know, who passed away a few years ago. Pete was a partner of Goldman Sachs, and she had appointed him to the Board of Regents. Pete was a Democrat. Um, and after a, a year, he figured out it was a 
intolerable conflict of interest with his, his partnership in Goldman Sachs. So he had to resign, and they were really looking, Ann was really looking to Pete to figure out how to solve this problem. And all of a sudden, he had to, he had to resign. So uh, she asked me if I thought I could solve the problem. And I, I told her I could. I, th I thought I knew exactly how to do it. I'd, I'd go t talk to all the smart people that are doing it the right way, and we'd, we'd ch change how we were doing. <clears throat> so she t took a gamble. She said, don't ever embarrass me. I'm going to appoint you. And uh, she gave me carte blanche total authority, which is interesting because it's all about power. Money is power. But for the governor to give up the power of that money, and then in turn, Bernie Rappaport was our chairman of the board, who's a wonderful man. <clears throat> uh, Bernie gave up that power, and they abdicated and said, all right, Tom, Tom's going to go solve this problem. We'll, we'll give him a chance to do this. And I went around to all the top university endowments in the country uh, and told them what we we're trying to do and got their advice. And it, it turned, I reached the conclusion there were two main, main problems. One is the Texas Constitution was set up where you could only spend realized gains. So you could only spend income. And, uh, you know, Harvard spends an allocation. They don't, it, you know, it's to total return. So that forced two things. It forces us to, uh, as, as a university, it forces us to buy way too many bonds because that was real income. And to have a 70% bond portfolio during the 80s when the stock market went up 300 percent was expensive. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the other problem was that the chairman of the Board of Regents has had, probably still does, virtually dictatorial powers uh, with the support of the rest of his board. So as it came to how they were going to manage the money, it was up to what the chairman of the board wanted to do. So if you were chairman of the board of and liked bonds and didn't like stocks, they'd do bonds. If they, if the other way, they'd do stocks. So there was no institutional memory. There was no continuity. So <clears throat> we, and, and, and then we couldn't pay people. Uh, I think Brett Harris is here tonight. Uh, Britain would have never been able to be attracted the Utemco in the old days. They were the pace gay were was, a, was compared to professors. So uh, when we set up Utemco, well, first of all, we had to go get a constitutional amendment to change to allow total return payouts, and I, I funded that the, lo the lobby effort personally. Uh, uh, we got it done. Uh, back then, the leaders in, in, the, in the legislature were Bob Bullock uh, uh, and, and, of course, Governor Richards. And they kind of stepped aside and allowed that to happen. And, uh, and we brought in outside directors with, on a nine-year term to create that institutional memory. Richard was one of our first, as I said. Uh, until he had to leave us. <clears throat> but we had uh, Luther King was there for nine years. Susan M Montgomery was there for nine years. And <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure how many outside directors there st still are, but it created a whole uh, uh, long-term view of how, how we do things. By the way, we did a, we did a, a, a simulation in 1995, where we went back to take the same asset allocation model we had adopted in 95 after we had done all this new stuff, and went back to 1980 and simulated what the returns would have been, and they would have been $20 billion higher. 
20 billion, and that's, you know, at the time we were, I think our total assets were 8 billion. So it, it was very expensive for the state of Texas to not have the right set up for managing their endowments. Uh, I am so proud of how you Temco turned out. Brett and his team are doing a great job. And uh, I think the, I think the assets are now six, 65 billion, up from about four. So anyway, when I sign my going away sheet at the end of the road, I'm going to if, of the things I'm proud of. There will be two things: Utimco and winning the Stanley Cup in 1999. Thank you.